Welcome to Tea Time with Shaylee and Amber, the podcast where we talk about all the shit that your horse wants you to know and what you can do about it. Amber is a horse trainer and a personal results coach, certified in Theta and Semitic Breathwork. Shaylee is an animal communicator who also teaches communication. Both knowledge seekers with the intention of sharing that knowledge and hoping that we can encourage the listeners to do the same. Welcome to the podcast today. We are chatting with Heather, a true cowboy with a passion for horses. We explore her journey from rodeo roots to horsemanship mastery. We dive into the misconceptions around the rodeo world and also dissect the foundation of the spade bit and the misunderstandings around that. We dive into the role of women in the ranching world and the amazing connection between horses and cows. Get ready for one of my favorite episodes yet. Let's go. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, we have a guest, Heather Corneman. Thank you for joining us, Heather. Yes, my pleasure. <laughs> We're super excited to chat with you. Um, so for those of you who are for people who might not know you, can you just like tell us a little bit about like who you are and what you're doing with horses and all of that fun stuff? Sure. Well, answering who I am is about as complicated as answering what I do because I don't, <laughs> have, I don't have a thing. Um, uh, so, so who I am first and foremost is I, actually what I do. And that is, I am a cowboy and I know that's a weird term that comes with all kinds of imagery, including Yellowstone and none of that is true. So what I, <laughs> What I do is, is um, what's called animal husbandry. I take care of cattle for a living and I manage the range that they live on and make sure that they are both feeding each other in a healthy way. So um, that's one side of my, of my full-time life. And the other side is um, the horse business, which for me is also... Um, very multi-layered. Uh, I, I do teach the bridal horse, the very traditional vaquero style of, of the bridal horse, meaning um, hackamore to rain and the big scary spade bit. Um, that I do teach that. I also do um, the Lazarus nerve release, but also um, one of her apprentice trainers. So those are, those are the two parts of, of my out in the public horse life. But I think what would describe me best is someone who really wants to, to take people who, who want to sort of a step away from industry standard way of doing things. And I like to come alongside and, and take people through the whole process. If, if they are starting at the beginning, meaning they don't even know how to fit their saddles or they don't know what they're looking at, as far as the right horse for them, I, I kind of like to start at the very beginning and see someone all the way through the end. That means more to me than if I can go to a clinic and have 40 people. I think uh, that is not a way to make money and I don't recommend that to anyone. Uh, but if you really want to see your, uh, your passion turn into fruition, it's getting to take people through an entire process, which I know Amber is very much like that too you have clients for 15 years you know <laughs> where you know it's just uh it's a long-term love affair to see people uh to the end so both of those lives are full-time so it's really hard to say i have balance because my balance means both full-time lives are getting fed um and getting equal parts of me which doesn't leave time for anything else but is that who I am? Did I answer who I am? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Do we really know who we are? No. <laughs> That's one of the questions that I think it was like the very first episode where we felt like we needed to introduce ourselves and we were like, well, we're lots of things. So I feel like right now in this moment, that is who you are. And that's how you ever evolving moment by moment. <laughs> right. Yeah, I yeah. know you and I had that conversation about when we stopped taking outside horses and the whole horse trainer thing, giving that up as a title, it's really hard because 
Will I ever stop bringing horses all the way through from start to finish? No, I won't. And will I ever stop getting on as many as I can wrap my legs around? No, I won't. I mean, that's one of the things that has, has enabled me to energetically align with horses so quickly is just by getting on so many at, and at, at every clinic or, every, you know, just getting on as many as I can, but it makes me better for my own selfishly. That's why I do it. Everything that I can gain from them makes me better for mine. And I know that sounds so selfish and singular focused, but at the end of the day, that's my goal personally is have partnerships like that are life saving and life giving with my horses. When we go into these coastal ranges every day and sometimes have to go really fast, knowing that they will take care of me and, and me, them, everything I can do to make that a better, more secure consensual relationship I'm going to do. So that's, you know, that's a big, that's a big reason why giving up horse training as a title once you are you are and it's and it's okay if it if it morphs and looks different but yeah and I think the biggest piece that I love about that whole thing is that people wonder if they can go back and strengthen the relationship and then have that level of conversation with the horse about how they feel and what they want and then what the horse wants and actually then go do things like, do we get to, do I ever get to ride my horse again? And I'm like, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> you do. that's the end game. I mean, no, there's lots of avenues to connection. I think that for me, it is very relational, but I, I make my connection through my hands and through my body with touch, you know, uh, and that happens for me uh, starting with as soon as I catch them. But um, because of what I do for a living, and I love it, and my horses are happy doing it, I know that that balance is possible. I know it because I've done it for so many years with horse after horse after horse. None of them, I mean, I have some that don't want to come to work today. They're like, Neh. and I'm like, yeah, me too. Neh. Now let's go, you know, <laughs> and, and, and we still have a beautiful day together and there is still give and take. And all of my mares are red. So there is a, obviously they can, they can give their all to a job and still have days they don't want to do it. And that I can connect to them energetically and very physically through all of it. It's all doable. Part about you. And also that I was saying that I realized I've only actually like hung out with you physically like twice but I will say like the moment and same thing with Shaylee I've only hung out with Shaylee one time it's so strange to even think about that like how the internet is weird um (laughs) but like when you meet somebody you have to think about how they feel and how you can just know that there's like some people that you're like I just want to like I think I hugged you before we said hi and I was I didn't actually know who you were but I knew who you were and I was like oh I love you I don't know who you are and you're like family now um but we have to think of like how we carry ourselves and how and who we are that's how we judge other humans right or like when we come into that space so the horses are picking up on that same stuff you know what I mean so it's it's like a really good way to you know look at yourself in the world and see how horses are responding to you and just see if yes. there's a the rest of your life. Yes. Uh, Love that. Yeah. So how I want to know the story. I mean, I kind of know the story, but I want everyone else to know the story about how you even got into this space because you weren't like born on a ranch. Nope. Mm-mm. Nope. We had a little thir- 13 acres in Ohio where we had a rodeo company. So on that 13 acres, we had 30 head of buck and bulls, 50 head of buck and horses, uh, we had rope and cattle um, and, and a, an arena um, all on 13 acres. So I, I actually grew up, yeah, um, basically on a rodeo feedlot <laughs> because, um, yeah, so yeah, I grew in the rodeo business. So that was a very different approach to horsemanship, <laughs> you know, um, but I learned really valuable uh 
things that set a foundation for being able to balance, you know, because we, we end up such a pendulum when we want to do something good, but I always have that balance of, of knowing that horses who buck for a living are actually happy also and very well taken care of and not forced, you know, so I have a really uh, wide view of the industry. Um, my dad trapped wild cattle for a living. He was also a, a journeyman farrier, very highly regarded, shot in Lexington and Louisville and all the big tracks in Indiana. So yeah, there was a there was a lot of layers to my horsemanship past. However, he was, um, I mean, all of the, like the horses that I ran barrels on and um, they were ex bucking horses. I carried the American flag on an ex bucking horse. Everything I had was a bronc that didn't buck anymore. And then I had to ride it. But they, these horses were so well mannered, not because they were scared, but because they were, they had boundaries and my dad set really strict boundaries when you're transferring a bucking horse to a using horse for a child. The boundaries were very, but they, because they were, they were um, set with a little bit of force that I wouldn't be able to emulate. I had to find my own way. I had to go my own way and find a way to communicate with horses that was not going to be through force. I was not going to have it. It didn't, it didn't set in me well to do things the way he did it even if it worked for him but I also physically was never going to be able to my dad's hands I mean I got man hands I mean my dad's hands you know so one wrap and and horses knew they were had <laughs> so yeah different world yeah was and then the question <laughs> yeah because I just remember you telling me how then when you went to college it was for something completely Oh Different. yeah, computer programming. Yeah. Hello, rodeo, computer programming, and now <laughs> so then what? that <laughs> that transition yeah. of growing up in a you know a space like that, doing what you did, then going, I'm gonna go com com I'm yes. gonna go from computers. Yes. And then, then it was you moving to a space where you're on a ranch running cat. Like, how did that transition happen? Um well, the, the living on a ranch full time was in kind of tiny increments, along with deciding whether or not training horses for the public was was something I could continue to do, wanted to do. But then always working for ranches. I was always day working, like before women were doing it like they are now, which I'm so happy about. There just wasn't that many of us that were what they call day tramps, which is just people who would day work for ranches. So I did that a lot, like in Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas and Colorado and you name it. Well, so I'd always been dabbling in and then I would take longer and longer stints, but I was a single woman. There wasn't a lot of places that you could work on a ranch full time that you weren't going to be bunking with a bunch of men. You know, that just wasn't, wasn't a great idea for anybody, you know? So it wasn't until um, my first marriage that I moved to the Sand Hills in Nebraska and we were in the middle of absolutely nowhere and 6,000 mama cows. And I'm like, yeah, I found it. This is, this is it for me. So what was it like living out there? Is the, I, the town and the space that you had, like, I feel like I'm really happy, like having space, but then also like, I like having like, civilization really nearby. <laughs> right. So in most ways it suited me perfectly. I, I, I am, I'm not alone in solitude. So I was really good with that. I was very, very busy and very consumed with the life. <clears throat> Those are the pretty, that's the pretty parts of it. As far as being injured, it was very, very scary because you have to make pretty split decisions. Like, is my injuries going to kill me because I am hours from help? You know, and um, there was a lot of those, a lot of that, a lot of injury. <laughs> so that part of it, I didn't get my hair done. I didn't do any of those things that would require me to live close to civilization. Now I do, thanks to you. <laughs> Of nails, but um, I had no, I had no need of any of that back then. I was, I became very, very primitive and very feral, <laughs> and you know, so the my pattern of no showers has always been the case, you know, and 
Uh, yeah, it worked well it, living away from people. But I also, because of my degree, I also did bookkeeping and accounting and, you know, stuff um, even when I was out there and remote wasn't a thing. So, yeah, I, I always try to balance both sides of my brain and, you know, having different needs. But what part was never fostered in those, in any of the lives that I ever lived is empathy and intuition. Those are not things that you were given any liberty to talk about, explore, or even really give into the idea that they existed. So a lot of those things just internally made me weird. And then I kept to myself. So it wasn't until California that I could not deny anymore and didn't have to because the universe was aligning me with people to feed that side and say, guess what? Those sides of you are, are beautiful and they are necessary and they are um, perfectly aligned with who you are and who you're going to be. And you don't have to hide those anymore and you don't have to stuff that anymore. And that it, it lended itself to, to being a cowboy also. I didn't have to be one or the other. I didn't have to lay one down to take up the other. I heard people say to me, you're too woo-woo to be a cowboy and too cowboy to be a woo-woo. And I'm <laughs> okay with that. It works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What was your first like experience in what wants to come out is meeting your gifts, like intuitively, like mm -hmm. starting to understand, like, wait a minute, how did I know that? Or what did that look like? Uh, I, I had a boarder when I first moved to Cal and she was a massage therapist, um, but she did it very energetically. She was the first one to introduce me to that. And she would say, you can do this with horses. I'm telling you, you can. So she would put her hands on my hands and she would guide them down the horse. And she'd say, stop when you feel the tissue saying anything different. And I'm like, okay. So I would do that. And I would give into allowing those things to speak. And then as soon as I started acknowledging them, then it was like, whoosh. So the more things my head learned was okay to acknowledge, the more the gifts flooded and the more realizations like, and that's still coming. It's still happening. Um, like I just took Celeste's nerve release course again. I took it, you know, she taught me in person a long time before there was this course, but, but there was something that happened underneath my fingers this time where the tissue spoke different and the, and the open, the receiving, uh, the receiving and giving of the communication happened so differently and so much faster. And I think it's because I keep evolving in my ability to recognize, to feel, to hear. Um, I, I have had, and I can, I can say that with you two and with the group that's gonna listen to this, but these are things I would have never thought myself to say. But I had a horse um, in South Dakota when I was on the face and the horse kept saying, and the owner's talking and I'm not listening because I'm thinking of the horse. And, and he said, that's not my name. That's not my name. That's not my name. And I'm like, hey, um, that's not his name. <laughs> and she's like, well, I didn't like the name he came with and I've only had him six months. So I'm just trying the same. I'm like, well, so he kind of knows what his name is, even if you don't. And, and I'm like, I can't believe I just said that to like a rancher that they're, that's not their horse's name. And they believed me. And I'm like, you know, that's, that's great. But because I do believe there's a boldness when you know you're speaking the truth from someone who just honestly told you something and yeah, that, that there's a boldness that comes from that. And then each time you allow them to communicate or yourself to feel and hear, it just, it gets better. Yeah. And so how do you feel like you're fostering that? Cause I feel like there's a lot of people that listen to this, that will get those little moments where they're like, what was that? Or was that a thing? Or is that just making that up? Like, is there anything that you do that you feel like is like expanding that specifically for you? Or is it just like happening and you can't stop it? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I think the idea that I wouldn't stop it if I could just that <laughs> absolutely, I will not turn the volume down. I won't push the mute button. I will not block out any communication that they're having with me. I just won't. And that, 
um, um, also comes with learning that it's not, it's not coming from me. So I have to honor if you're chosen to speak a truth. It's really rude to not listen. <laughs> I can't be rude. <laughs> but no, I think just giving them, giving yourself repeated permission, but then also saying, I absolutely will not, you know, I will not turn the volume down. I will not hit mute. Right. And then how do you decipher between you thinking things versus the, the communication you're getting from like the animals? I love that you ask that because <laughs> I ask myself that same question. <laughs> Sometimes what, what I do is here's where skill and experience do come in because I have, you know, I'm 50 this year and I, I've probably been in this business for 30 years. So I have from a young age been, you know, compiling skill and experience and observation and what works and what doesn't work and what is truth and what is rhetoric and what is theory and what is fact, you know, like I have a long time of putting all that together. And so I do filter that sometimes. And I then decided that some somewhere between what I'm getting and then and the skill that I have to know generals and very common things about horses are often one in the same and when they are not um, I have to say so this is what I think or this is what I feel based on what I know to be generally true I think it's also okay if it's both, like this is what I'm getting. And because of what I have seen over the last blah, blah, number of years, I would say that it's, that, that's a, it's a pretty clear representation. That's different than when a horse says, that's not my name. I have no skill for that. I have no, <laughs> I have nothing to go back on to say, yeah. I just always had the feeling though, that when, and I could be completely wrong, but I don't think so. I mean, my husband says, I think I'm never wrong, but it's just so I'm not that often. It, it can happen. Anyway, I, I think they a lot of times know their name. And just because they've changed owners and they're, they have to jump into this whole new world and then they change their name and they're just going, you know, you're making me wonder who I even am. Like I, you know, every time an owner to the name, I, I don't know. I've always thought that was hard on them, that there is some identity that follows them in their core that they kind of want to cling to. Maybe it is connected to a name, maybe it's not, but yeah. So from like an animal communicator perspective, and I, I am not saying that like my experience is perfect. I've only really been truly doing it since 2018, but um, they, it's so interesting naming. So like, I always ask for their names and I will say there are some horses that are like super adamant on keeping their name. Like it's just part of yeah. it, If they were named in a sense of like pride or a place of like, you know, deep understanding or like, you know, the person really loves them. They're excited about them, whatever in the case may be all that good energy behind the name and then when it's changed um like if the person is changing it because they don't like it that's usually when i see some of the pushback because they're kind of like well i do have all this energy behind my name and here you are trying to change the first thing about me like we're going into this conversation all wrong but then i have other horses who will um like want their name changed because they will because it's tied to like bad history or whatever and then it's like such a gray area when you get like a horse from an auction right and no one knows their name and then you oh. bring them into your experience and like yeah. they don't have a name and here you are like stuck naming them but I think like it's so interesting to me like when you do get those really strong pushes as far as names go because that that's like tied to their history. So yeah, it, it's wild how actually they, they all have different opinions about their names. <laughs> I love that. I'm so glad you weighed in on that. I was, I, I wasn't sure that conversation would come up except sometime in the future, when I got to work with you, I, I wanted to say 
something about the name because that's the first time that ever came across. And I knew you probably had run into that a time or two. So I'm so glad you weighed in on that. That's really interesting. The idea that a positive name coming from um, a beautiful part of their past carries that, that energy, that legacy, that pride. And those are the ones they're gonna wanna keep. I love that. That makes so much sense to me. So I do wanna ask you, cause you were like talking about the spade bit. And when I looked at, um, I, when I looked at your Facebook page, I saw a picture of it. Like I, I, I'm assuming it's a spade bit. It's got all kinds of like little fancy beads and like a port and everything. Yeah. I thought and I had one I in here. At, and I was like, is that something she hangs on her wall? And then I was like, no, that shit has like spit on it and stuff. Like that is something that she's using. So yep. I'm curious, like what? Cause I don't actually know that much about like, I like I grew up in the English. Well, it's actually kind of funny cause I grew up um, riding English and jumping and stuff. But then I dated um, a bullfighter and a bull rider and <laughs> a bronc rider. And I got wow. kind of into the radio scene and the bullfighter that I dated um, worked for this guy, Buster Webb, who um, had like all the bulls and the horses and stuff. And I got to see like, we got like a truck and a camper and I got to like travel to all these rodeos. And, like, you lived see, your like, life. How did I not know uh -huh. that you weren't dating rough stock riders? Because so oh was I. How did you not this talk this to this before? I also We've dated a, and a cattle bronc rider and a... We yes. should probably do a podcast. Yeah. <laughs> we, we need a whole podcast for dating. It radio. was like a wild experience. Yeah. And I like didn't know how I would feel as I moved into like this spiritual space of my life and like very empathetic. And now I'm like way fucking woo where like I don't even eat meat anymore and all this stuff. <laughs> but it was really cool to like get that experience. And I'm not saying that like every person who owns livestock, but what I will say is like, it made me feel good to hear what you said about like the way you guys took care of your animals, mm -hmm. even though they were on like small acreage and stuff like that, because my experience, I feel like rodeo gets a lot of flack. And while I do feel bad for the baby cows that get roped, um, I, I got oh, me too. There's no way I don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's sad. But I, I got firsthand experience of like the way that the bulls were treated and the way that the horses were treated and it was so cool to me because they like were not fed shit hay. They were like fed such good hay. They, the first thing we did when we like unloaded them, like everybody got fresh water. He knew exactly which bulls were comfortable with the other bulls, which ones weren't. Like he paid for extra space. Like, yeah. so it was actually really cool to get that space and then being around the energy of them, knowing that they were like in that high sympathetic drive during the rodeo. And of course, anything can happen, you know, like horse could break it's like doing dressage too you know what I mean yeah. so like anything can yep. happen like bodies are are their bodies but it was cool to me for them to um like I, I still remember him be, like not letting people stand on the fences at the rodeos because he didn't want his horses getting like he's like no this is their downtime like if they're not performing they need yes. a place to rest and, like, yes it was really cool to experience that and that has helped me a lot like moving forward um, I think there's a lot of like outside judgment sometimes from people who have never experienced the back end of yes. the way certain animals are. And I see it all the time too, because I feel like because of what I do, the algorithms have all these freaking like, um, save the animal things that pop up on my pages. And I always have all this like vegan for life and stuff that, and I'm not saying that I'm not like part of that world, but it's just so interesting to see how there's a real lack of education on yeah. some of the people post so so I'm curious yeah. um about the bit because I know I saw that and I was like what the fuck is that and then I was like I'm so curious to ask her like why is the bit a thing and like yeah what's yep. the story behind it I I love to talk about that it those are very long topics but I will I will try to condense as much as I can about Spade Bit because I do believe it is the most, the single most misunderstood piece of equipment in all of Horse Kingdom. And it is because people have so many misconceptions about the function of the mouth, for one, and the function of the bit. So the reason for its size, if you've ever taken a skull off and looked at the amount of space in there, is a lot. So 
the the reason for the size everything about it every piece on it is designed to protect the horse from you so everything about it is is in balance with how they're made everything sits inside of their mouth um, to keep them straight to keep them in balance to keep them from putting a crick in their spine to keep um you from being able to take them in a position that's not natural for them to move. It is the only piece of equipment that by itself promotes 100% balance for a horse. They can pick it up and hold it and take it with them because of the braces. They can pick it up and hold it between their lips. And because of the size of it, their tongue can lift it and hold it. So it protects against um, any pressure on the bars, it protects against over rotating. That's what the braces do. So it is literally the only piece of equipment with built in protection. And that's not something that I say to defend something that I love. That's something that I love because I learned how it works. And in my world, um, things can be really fast. Things can get, you know, when we're trying to bring the cattle together to move them somewhere and we've got brush and we've got oak trees and we've got, you know, inclines and declines that are severe, things can get a little fast. You want a piece of equipment that is going to protect your horse from those speeds and those changes in balance. And that's what this bit does. And so it was because of the research that I fell in love with it. And it was spending you know now i spent 14 years horse after horse after horse um watching it promote the the truest forms of connection and i a lot of people get to connection of course through other ways but for me having a piece of equipment but that was designed to speak their language everything about it speaks to balance and stability in their body and giving them the freedom to move uh, the way they are designed for. And, and it's the only thing that moves like a horse. So if we ever can do, um, if we can ever do something, you know, where we're in person and I can really demonstrate for you how, how they uh, mechanically work, it will absolutely blow your mind because one of the other cool things about the spade bit, people think that they're severe because of the height um, the height is what protects it from ever being used as leverage. So when you pick up on a spade bit, if you need it, you have nothing. So by the time you get to the stage where you use one, it's because you no longer need it. It is for the utmost um, refinement because every little, every little wiggle of that says something to their whole body, not just their mouth but if you try to take it or pull it you have nothing it can do nothing it can say nothing <laughs> so it's 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 all built in protection and horses understand it immediately like there are there are horses that i have had that i have rehabbed and just by hanging the spade bit in their mouth and setting on them and breathing they find a balance um, in motion that they had learned wasn't an option for them just by the communication that the bit itself was having with their body. Like the, the small window in history where that was designed um, by the Vaqueros was a very unique point in history where they had to do nothing else but spend all day on their horse riding around investigating the idea of less and less and less. And that's what their whole goal was, to be able to do big things like run cattle down or rope them, or it was the hide and tallow trade. So at the time it was all, you know, they were all for ships that went overseas with hide and tallow. So their, their main objective is to do very big things with minimal, um, interference from us to the horse. So their, their method for training was to, excuse me, was to start with a hackamore and then 
as you go through the training of actually creating a horse for self carriage, by the time you're in the spade bit, it takes only a blink, only a twist of my finger to say a lot to the horse. And it's not because I'm being harsh or I'm being demanding. It's because every little whisper to that means something so pure to them. So that was a long, <laughs> I tried to condense as much as I could. <laughs> well, I think the piece that people miss with that is the amount of steps that there are in years of oh development my. that go into creating an actual bridal horse and that should be carrying a speed. But I think that's the piece that people don't quite understand. Yes. Like, the process is long and lengthy and like, <sighs> And so the, the piece about actually having a horse that understands that it makes me upset when I, um, when I'm around and, you know, in different circles, it's like, Oh, well they had a spade. And I'm like, oh. like if that horse is carrying that bit, right. Like that is like years and years and years, of like shit. nine and 10 years. Yeah. Of, Before of they get to that thing. yeah. So it's interesting that correlation between the misconception of even just the stuff with the rough stock at rodeos, cause it's the same thing. It's like, you think about those horses and how they're bred for that. You know, it's not like they're just saddle horses that buck because those ones are always the ones to stop bucking, right? They get to fully express themselves once they get out there. You know, they're like, yep. there's nothing restraining them. They're like full out, let me like all the things. And then they go back and then they chill out into the pasture, out with their buddies. Like they have a better life than most, I feel like horses that are in barns. <laughs> oh my, they do. They do yeah. without question. The eight seconds that they get to have the zoomies uh, for the rest of the time off of leisure, yeah, they do have a better life. When we used to get, um, we used to get a lot of activists uh, when I was, um, I had went back and, and took over working for my dad's company for a while and we got a lot of activists and I decided, okay, information is the best way to combat a misconception. So I would invite them all in and take them back and we would go through everything and we would talk about everything. And I'm like, if you really, really want to find where horses are being abused, go to the Western Pleasure Barns with all the pretty flowers. You're going to find real abuse there. And sorry if that's what anyone does, but it's the truth. I think it's a good point to like mention in this pause because you're talking about the spade bit and you're like, as soon as I get on this horse, you know, he, he softens. And I'm like, is it the bit or is it your energy though? So oh, I like that it's like, totally, because I do think it's your energy. And I think that I'm glad that Amber said that because I honestly am like super naive about it. Like have never even seen it until I got on your Facebook and I was like, hot damn, want to ask about that. Um, <laughs> and I, I think it's cool that it's something yeah, for refinement. Like, I, I like what you say about it. I've never gotten to talk to a horse that has ever worn one. So it would actually be kind of cool to like talk to a couple horses because like to hear their perspectives. Awesome. My own. Yeah. Fun. But, yeah. Um, well, I have 12 yeah, of so, them if you want, <laughs> if you want to talk to yeah, them. Yeah, I totally want to like chat them up and hear what they say about it. And so, and it just, it makes me think like how you're saying you're using it from a, a protective standpoint when you're working with them on like the hills and stuff. And that's so interesting to me because I talk to a lot of endurance horses and these horses are going in like hackamores more and more. And they're, I have a few that have like significant damage to their nasal bones because they trip or whatever. And the person will be holding the reins and it, um, the hackamore, you know, it's like the weight of the person against the hackamore. But it's my assumption that if you're using this mm. bit, it nothing would happen if the horse tripped because you're essentially on the buck well not on the buckle because you're in western reins but like you're essentially on a loose rein right so like the horse has their head and you would potentially just use it to turn them or whatever um right and you don't really even use it to turn them because you can't take a spade bit away from center so that's part of the the foundation of years of them learning to turn and follow your balance because if you take a spade bit off center, it pulls their face the wrong direction. So you cannot neck rein with a spade bit. You don't, you don't leave center. So um, yes, I am essentially on a loose rein unless I am going through trees and then I just tighten enough that the reins aren't swinging and they're gonna grab something. But the reason they can protect it is because they can clinch around it. Um, they can, they can, um, 
basically take their tongue and push it up to the roof of their mouth and it protects them. I, mean, I have seen horses fall face down where the shanks were driven backward like that. And there was some, um, there was some damage to the roof of the mouth, but it takes an incredible amount of force for that. But I have seen way more accidents, way more trauma to the face over the years of snaffle bits being pulled through the cheeks, you know, from accidents like that, you know, trees catching the snaffle bit and ripping it through the mouth. I see that way more often in the cowboy world than I ever have injuries from a spade bit fall. Yeah, and, and hackamores, um, interestingly enough, I have got to do this one of these days. I have got to do a little, a little podcast or a little something. Celeste's been asking me to do it for the masterclass forever, and I just don't. But the idea that a hackamore is a bitless bridle is, is, is another big misconception that I would love to talk to people about because they're, no, they're not... They, they don't function at all the same. And if people are using a hackamore with any type of full contact or full pull, it is like using a lawnmower to paint your house. They, it's not in any way, shape or form a, a piece that can be used with contact. So I would love to do that someday just to give a little contrast. So if people are choosing, they're at least, they know what they're choosing and they're choosing for the right reasons um, instead of using a piece that's really not designed for that, that as you pointed out, could cause damages if they're not using it right. Yeah, for sure. That's so many interesting points. I feel like I'm kind of lucky because I get to talk to like such a diverse amount of people and like different disciplines and horses and stuff. And like, it's wild to me how, um, you know, there's no one right answer either. Like mm -hmm. it's like the person nope. level. It's so funny. Cause I like the first thing that I thought of, cause I ride in like a bitless bridle now, um, because my horses like snacks and the, the thing that I saw when I saw that bit, I was like, Oh, I guess there's no snacks for her horses. Like they're not going to be grazing. Like they're working horses out there. Nope. No one's going to nope. be chowing no down. No snacking. <laughs> uh uh. And they love their food. I mean, my baby's got back. They love their food. But yeah, no, not 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 why we're working. <laughs> no, I do drop it on long days. Um, I do drop the bit every time we drink. I drop it, you know, to let them graze if they're if we're going to be waiting for a while. So. That's the kind of snacks they get. Yeah. One of my favorite parts about you is that the world that you're in and how you pull all of that together as far as like the balance of the two, right? Like the cowboy mm -hmm. and the, having it be really spiritual and how you're just like living completely authentically yes. in it. Um, yeah. Me knowing what a badass you are, but then remaining super fucking humble always, which is what my favorite qualities in people. They're badasses and they're humble. It's my favorite. Um, and so the only experience I have actually had at brandings and stuff is where most of the people that were kind of running things were women. And I don't know if it was just because that's where I was and she owned the ranch and, yeah. and it was, it was awesome because it felt like that never was like a thing. Like the, the guys weren't like, Oh, that woman, blah, blah, blah. It was just this, like across the board, complete respect yes. for everyone had for each other. It didn't matter if you had a penis or a vagina like nobody right. just like that's right and so I think that a lot of people are real focused on that type of stuff right now so um, what is that like for you because I know you have you have several women in your crew when you're working right I think that's what I remember you telling me we, sometimes we are all women and my husband yeah right. because number one women um and this is true for all Midwest, well, you know, I've ranched in the Midwest and the Northwest and the women are run in the ranches, even if they aren't the face of it, when it comes to the nitty gritty, they are, it's happening a lot. And it, and it really honestly always has been, it's just women are being, are more comfortable letting that be known. It was known in secret, but now it's just, everyone's way more comfortable with that just being the way it is. And we don't have to hide that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, you know, that's been my experience that the strong women running ranches has always been the thing. What wasn't as common as it is now is women who cowboyed for a living and people don't understand that that's also very different. 
you know, we have, my husband and I have ran ranches. We've managed several, um, but what we also have cowboyed for a living and we, you know, so we've done both, but, but they are two different things. So when I was beginning, I was cowboying for a living, but, but that, you know, it wasn't necessarily me running a ranch. It was just, you know, working for the day. Right. So, um, now you see more and more and more girls who are cowboying for a living and, and I freaking love it because they are good. Everybody knows it. You know, um, they are, they just, you do. So most of our crews are women. That's who wants to work. That's who wants it. That's who wants this life. It's, it's women. The men, I don't know where they are. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Most of you guys ride mares then also because you were like, oh, all my horses are red mares. <laughs> uh -huh. My husband has, um, so we have split herds. We have a gelding herd and a mare herd. And the only reason we split them is because the geldings get retarded when they're mixed with the girls. Um, so we split them and we have 50-50. I have three mares, all red and three geldings, mostly red. And he has three mares and three geldings. So when I met him, he didn't ride any mares. Now he's 50, 50 mares because, you know, let's face it, they are tougher. They will come home on one leg if they have to. If something happens, they have no quit in them. They are just the toughest, grittiest. Yeah, we have a mare that she was, um, we rescued her. She was a three-day eventer. Um, and then she was a jumper and she's not broke. Like, literally not broke. You can't turn left, right, but she can do any maneuver you put in front of her. So she's, her body is wrecked, but she hunts cattle with her nose on the ground. Like she loves it so much that she hunts them like a, like a coon dog. It's amazing. <laughs> so we do ride a lot of mares. I would say primarily our days are on mares <laughs> and I love that too. Um, I wanted to ask you about that, like the right horse for the job. And like, I was curious if you're like, you know, set on having quarter horses or whatever, because um, when I talk to horses, it's so interesting to me how like people want to get, so my heart is in thoroughbreds and it's so wild to me how thoroughbreds kind of get stuck in like the English industry for the most part. And I have so many thoroughbreds that are like, well, at least in my experience, like they I, I talk to a lot of horses that are jumping and they want to like try pushing a cow around and the person is like, yes. Oh, I don't know. Like you're not a quarter horse or whatever. And I I'm curious, like what your perception is and like how many varieties of like breeds are in your industry? Because I think people, society almost has this view of like, well, if you want to work cattle, you have to have a quarter horse. And if you want to jump, you have a, you know, thoroughbred yeah. and then warm bloods are for dressage. So like, what's, yeah, what's your experience with that? So thoroughbreds belong on ranches for one. I think it's, it's not fair that they get cornholed because they are exceptional ranch horses. They have um, great stamina. Uh, we have one thoroughbred mare and one thoroughbred cross mare. They're they are extremely cowy. They love cattle. They, so the difference between like a quarter horse um, is what people call, you know, really cowy. They're, they're scared of cattle. That's what makes them so cool. Cutters are actually terrified of cattle. That's what gets all that draw and all that action in front of a cow. Thoroughbreds are like, Rawr! they have no, they have no fear. They are all attack mode and they are spectacular ranch horses i mean they so you see a lot of uh desert ranches that are use all thoroughbreds because they're the only ones that can do it they don't use quarter horses they don't want them quarter horses so they're not they don't they're not built for the distance you know they're built for a quarter of that <laughs> so small ranches yeah they want quarter horses because typically they're you know um, better in tight spaces they're better at sorting you know which we do a lot of so with everything, I have a uh, quarter horse that is 13, three, technically she could be a pony. And then um, we have thoroughbreds. We have, my husband's horses are 16 hand plus monsters. So I, I, I love them all. I've tried them all. I think uh, just personally, 
I go for the Cowie little quarter horse because it's, it's just more me. Um, it's better suited in these coastal ranges. They do better with the climbing. Um, and yeah, I, I like them better. I like their stride. It, it's my rhythm that it suits better, but nope, it should be all kinds. I mean, I even think warm bloods would make excellent, you know, excellent ranch horses. When I do like the cow horse clinics where I introduce cattle and horses that have never been, the warm bloods are so much fun. I put them on a long line, like a, like a dog on a leash. And I just let them go through and terrorize the cattle in every way they can. Like they need to dominate them. And then the fear is right out the window. So yeah, it's all kinds, all kinds. Did that answer your question? Cause I kind of sometimes chase squirrels. <laughs> no that's totally totally answered it and it, I like Amber and I have been talking because she said that she used to be able to like chase this little like I guess it was like a single cow I can't remember you had she she was telling me about like a lazy cow that some guy had oh um there's a guy Eric in our area that was doing clinics for people that had all kinds of dis all the disciplines and he had like a couple just like cows that were like <clears throat> And yeah, he went to these clinics and these, you know, little you come in your dressage saddle, you come in whatever. And he was really yeah. laid back and he would do those and they were a huge hit, but it started around 2020 and then it all kind of went to shit because everything did. Uh, um, but like the horses, like it just makes their hearts so happy to be able to do something like that. I don't know. My horses I can tell haven't been on cows for a while because they start to get really like angsty. And I just joke they need like a cow fix. <laughs> they do. Yeah, they get cow fresh. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right well it was a lovely hanging out with you heather yes and, um we know that you've got a lot going on and there's if people want to hunt you down and get your services that they can do you have a website or you're just doing uh social media stuff <laughs> yeah i secured a, I, I secured a domain name yeah that was it that's been a while ago. <laughs> i can't so figure out what to do with it from there so no um, so if you're craving the one more thing, Heather in your life, you can go to her Facebook and look at her, see what she's yeah. doing there. <laughs> yes. Cause the one thing I, I, um, like you asked me earlier, the one thing that I am going to put out there for 2024 that I want to see if there's an interest in and would love to gear more toward doing is, is intensives here, you know, where I can really spend some hardcore time with people and, not just get to, you know, hit a few high spots, but actually work through some things because it's, you know, as you know, it's one thing to be able to affect the horse and, and make a difference for them, but to be able to hand somebody something that can give them a lasting change that, I, so I, I would like to open up to do maybe more of those next year. I would sign up for that. So, <laughs> so <laughs> just come play. Sign me up. Play with me. <laughs> okay well it was lovely talking to you and um and yeah so is this where we do the awkward goodbye yeah, thing do you, no do you hear me trying to end <laughs> yeah well so uh okay bye <laughs> but we, we should just go one two three hit leave <laughs> uh, um okay bye everybody <laughs> bye thanks for having me